You're listening to the Braver Angels Podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, John Wood Jr. And I'm joined today by a fascinating individual, somebody who has been recommended to me for a very long time, somebody who I had the uh, privilege of appearing uh, alongside of uh, as part of a fairly illustrious uh, (laughs) cast of characters uh, in the uh, uh, Dark Horse Black Intellectual uh, Roundtable and the Dark Horse Podcast, Brett Weinstein. Some of you folks will have seen that, but if not, you might want to check it out. The individual I'm joined by today uh, is the author of of Losing My Cool and uh, a uh, columnist at the Atlantic Magazine. Uh, columnist or oh, contributor? No, no, Har- Harper's. At Har- oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, maybe I should run that back really quick. No, you did write for the Atlantic though previously, right? Just freelance. I'm, I'm at oh, the okay. New York Times Magazine and, and Harper's. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so let me run it back really quick. I'll simplify the introduction. I, us- I usually just, uh, it's very rare that I go back and redo something, but I had a treat. Sorry. I had a treat. <laughs> you know, I did, I broke my routine, Thomas. That's the problem. I had a, like a big chorizo sandwich for breakfast and I usually don't <laughs> eat, I usually don't eat breakfast at all. So that's part of the issue here. Oh, that's bad. I know, you, right? You got to eat breakfast. Well, yeah, but, you know, but jumping back into breakfast with like a big, like, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Mexican food sandwich was not perhaps the way to go. Okay. Let's take it. Okay. It's Harper's Magazine. Got it. Um, yeah. Okay. For sure. Okay. And I'm joined today by a fascinating guest, Mr. Thomas Chatterton Williams. Thomas is the author of Losing My Cool and a columnist at Harper's Magazine. Thomas, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Thanks for having me. I mean, well, it's my pleasure and uh, it's my pleasure and honor, really. Um, you're a person who's been, uh, whose work has been cited to me and you've been recommended to me for a long time as a commentator and insightful voice uh, on race and society. And uh, of course, I've had the opportunity of taking in a number of your interviews and I look forward to taking in more of your written material, but I've already developed a great esteem for, uh, for you and your perspective on things. So it's good to have you here. Um, Thomas, I um, want to uh, start off by asking you to say a little bit about your uh, your background, your upbringing. I know that you have something of a uh, well-studied uh, personal biography. I mean, well-studied by outside observers who have read Losing, uh, Losing Michael and so forth. But how would you describe your upbringing and kind of where you come from culturally, if you will? Sure. I grew up in the 80s and 90s um, in suburban New Jersey, the son of a black man uh, from the segregated South. Uh, My father's from Galveston, Texas. He was born in the late 30s and was fully an adult before civil rights. Um, My mother is a white evangelical Christian from Southern California. My parents met working together in anti-poverty programs. and by the time that I was being raised in, in the 80s and 90s in New Jersey, my father was, um, was earning a living by teaching SAT tests. Uh, he was running an SAT preparation business out of the house, GRE prep, LSAT, um, AP class prep. He was teaching chemistry, philosophy, literature um, to students who would come and pay to sit in the living room and study with him. Um, and that was how he supported the family. And my brother and I became like captive mm-hmm. living students uh, in this house that was really small, but full of books. And, mm. um, and so I had, I, you know, I grew up uh, trying to, you know, fit into my social environment and uh, ended up really like downplaying the, the kind of academic uh, intellectual path my father was trying to lead me down and really threw myself into what sociologists might call cool pose culture, Mm. uh, trying to be, you know, trying to, I guess, uh, perform a kind of idea of black masculinity that was sold and glamorized through hip hop culture uh, or the kind of hip hop culture that my friends and I were encountering. Um, And then I went to Georgetown University, studied philosophy um, and moved to New York City, studied cultural reporting and criticism at NYU. And in the course of, you know, moving away from home and reflecting on some of these things, I began to have a kind of a critical 
understanding of some of the cultural influences that I think um, led my friends and I down uh, a path that wasn't necessarily um, in our best interest. Mm. Uh, I began to think very much about the different Americas that my father and I had inhabited, the opportunities that I had, that my friends and I had, and some of the opportunities that we squandered, as opposed to the opportunities that were denied my father and people he grew up around and that he fought for. Mm. Um, and so this kind of culminated in a coming of age memoir, Losing My Cool, that I published in 2010. That was, um, <clears throat> it was a criticism of, of uh, <clears throat> how well, it was a criticism of the ways in which black identity can be conflated with a kind of street authenticity. Right. Um, and it was also a love letter to my father and this kind of uh, idea of blackness that's expansive and that's, that's, um, that would be embodied in, you know, it's the kind of Albert Murray, Ralph Ellison kind of, um, blackness as discipline and struggle and overcoming and fundamentally American and not, uh, not a source of trauma or victimization, but as something great and noble and, 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 and worthy. And so, um, losing my cool, that dropped in 2010, um, and that was right around the time that I met my wife, uh, who comes from France, and we moved to to Paris in 2011. Hmm. Right. Okay. So there's a there's a particular point I want to get to here, but uh, if you don't mind, let me just say a little bit about my own upbringing because the parallels between you and I are just are very interesting. And it's funny as I listen to you, I, I become conscious of the fact that, so you know. I, this will become relevant too, but obviously society, particularly in the United States of America, looks at me as a as a black man, which I am, but I'm also you know biracial, right? Um, and um, but it occurs to me that I don't too often get to sit down or talk to somebody who's kind of who who's I don't want to say bifurcation because it's unified in your experience, I I, I think, but who has these two different streams running through your story in a way that's kind of like what, you know, runs pretty close to, to, to mine in some respects. So, uh, you were born in 1981, right? Um, and you're from, uh, originally New, New Jersey. Is that, is that correct? Right. So I was born in 1986. I'm from Los Angeles. Uh, my mother is African American. She's from inner city LA. She's from South central Los Angeles. Uh, my father uh, was born in 1950. My mother was born in 1963. My dad is from Tennessee. Um, and uh, he is now very much politically conservative. Um, doesn't really come from a conservative religious background exactly, but he was always sort of the traditionalist uh, in our family. And I was raised with a certain amount of Southern nostalgia. And so that's a little bit different than having a parent who was a, a white evangelical Christian. But there's some... There, there's a cultural uh, conservatism that of a kind that that comes through that, right? And um, I was raised. I grew up in a suburban, multicultural sort of uh, environment, uh, Culver City, California, which is where the motion picture studios are largely uh, largely housed in uh, in LA. Uh, I I resonate with what you say about um, this conception that you had that authentic blackness is urban blackness right mm -hmm. and um i remember growing up i went to a very integrated school district and i remember being distinctly aware of the fact that there seemed to be two different kinds of black kids there were me and some black kids who seemed kind of a little bit more i i guess more adjusted <laughs> to the institutional sort of, and I wouldn't have used the word institutional in elementary school, but that, that were more adjusted to sort of the, the, the landscape that we were in. And then there were kids who were bussed in from South LA and so forth, um, from inner city LA, who seemed to bring with them a very different bearing, a different, you know, experience. And I wanted to be a lot more like those kids and like my cousins and, you know, some of my relatives in, in the inner city. Because they seem so much, you know, seems so much more raw, so much more real, so much cooler, you know, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so I, I won't speak too much more about what that meant for me because I want to know what it meant for you. But I will say that at a certain point in my story, though, uh, I grew up and I, I ultimately married a woman who was from the Jordan Downs Projects uh, in Watts. And I wound up 
sort of going on this path where I, I became enmeshed in that cultural experience. Um, and that had very definite implications uh, for me. So I'm going to pause my story uh, here and, and uh, jump back to you really quick. Um, you, you talked about you learned to appreciate a version of blackness that was about overcoming and so forth. Um, I'd be curious to have you elaborate on what blackness sort of, I guess, means to you, you know, what it, uh, tell me more about what, what that appreciation wound up feeling like for you, what it means to you. And, um, I guess if you could say something about how that travels with you or doesn't travel with you, uh, in terms of you having married a, you know, a, a white woman, then living in Europe and so forth and gun, going to a very different cultural context. Um, give us that that uh that stream of the story sure uh, it's a it's a complicated stream i think <clears throat> it's important to start by saying i grew up very much maybe you did too with the notion of the one drop rule yeah. being uh mm -hmm. fundamentally real and mm -hmm. kind of unquestionable mm -hmm. uh a drop of black blood uh makes a person black uh right. you know the laws of hypo descent going back to slave times um which come out of, you know, a kind of need to um, keep people from inheriting property is one, one reason <laughs> those laws were developed. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this creates a very complex American reality that most Black people are quite familiar with, which is that Black people physically are the most diverse looking people in America. They mm -hmm. can be anything from Mariah Carey to to Bokeem Woodbine, you know, like yeah. Adam Clayton, Adam gamut. Clayton Powell, uh, Adam Clayton Powell said, we've got everything from chalk to charcoal in our own race. Uh, yeah. yeah so. And yet, you know, we throw it under the label of blackness and, you know, most of us see how the logic works uh, intuitively, if not, um, if not always, you know, scientifically, and there is no scientific uh, basis for race, which we, mm -hmm. we, we basically pay, lip service to that, but most of us, or certainly the way that I grew up, I believed that race was real mm -hmm. and that um, divisions between black and white were meaningful and real. Um, I understood that I had a white mother, but uh, I grew up in a house where um, my father's a sociologist by training and, you know, he told me race is a construct, but this is a black, this is a black household. Right. And, you know, that made a certain degree of sense to me. I thought of blackness as something that, uh, was either or, you're either black or you're not black. Um, and I thought that there were ways in which your behavior communicated that. And it was important to, to, to perform a kind of uh, blackness, mm. authentic blackness, racial right. authenticity. Um, it wasn't until um, I reached the age of 30, 31 or so when I was living in Paris with a wife who it, I realized looked physically uh, in many ways, like my mother, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, that it started to dawn on me that uh, children that we would have mm -hmm. uh, may not present physically as very black. Um, and so, you know, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times around 2012, the year before my wife uh, gave birth, um, before she was even pregnant, just arguing that any children that I would have would be black, period, because blackness is a kind of... Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of loyalty as mm. well as a genetic inheritance. And, right. you know, I, in retrospect, realized that I wrote this, ar this argument um, to convince an audience of one who was myself, because I was realizing that all of the things that I had kind of believed in were in jeopardy. And it turned out that when my daughter was born, the way that she did physically appear, um, I guess I would say I thrust the, the fiction of race before my consciousness in a way that I hadn't dealt with in the past. Mm -hmm. I ended up writing an essay about this that became my second book, Self-Portrait in Black and White, Unlearning Race. And um, I contradicted the argument I made in that op-ed uh, because I realized that there was something profoundly crazy about sending a girl like this out into the world with the logic of the one drop rule mm -hmm. um, governing how she conceives of herself and determining the kind of arguments she would be constantly getting in um, in describing herself uh, in a society that doesn't even understand this logic because mm. what that rule is first of all it's specific to America right. in many ways. So 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 this became a process of me questioning the white black binary <clears throat> itself. It's not that I thought I had a white daughter now. 
or that I'm not black, but is that I realize that these terms don't really adequately capture either of us and that they fail actually on a societal level as well. Hmm. So, you know, so what do I think of blackness uh, where I am now? I think of blackness as a tradition, as a culture, as an ethnicity, as describing a group of people um, in America who are fundamentally American, hmm. who came through a certain set of circumstances, who transcended their circumstances and achieved quite a lot, who shaped American and Western and global culture in extraordinary ways, uh, a completely new and modern people, as Albert Murray or Ralph Ellison would argue, or Stanley Crouch, um, who in those 400 years they spent in the new world became something different than the people <clears throat> in the old continent. These are people that are genetically descended from Europe, Africa, and oftentimes have Native American uh, mixed in. They're a fundamentally mongrel people. Mm -hmm. um, I thought of myself uh, as being of this community of people, mm. um, and it's a meaningful community, uh, but I no longer can believe that it's a racial community, and mm. I don't believe um, that racial language, terminology, ways of thinking um, helps us helps any of us, whether you're mixed in your whether your parents are, supposedly of two different races or not. Uh, the idea of mixed raceness was something else that I began to reject because it implies that uh, other people are pure, which mm -hmm. when you get into the biology of it doesn't make sense either. Right, right. Yeah, I think I resonate with your way of describing uh, blackness. Um, and I want to circle back around, well, I want to circle back around here a little bit. Uh, first of all, um, this is just very fascinating for me. When I, you asked, uh, well, you, you mentioned that the idea of the one drop rule was present for you uh, from an early age. And uh, I, I think it was for me too, but interestingly enough, my first sense of racial identification was basically uh, post-racial to begin with. Um, I remember being distinctly aware uh, when I was a little kid, I mean, you know, three, four, five years old, of the fact that Whereas most families I saw, most parents and their children all were more or less the same color or within a, you know, within a few shades of each other. There were three distinct colors uh, in my in my house. My mother, who was darker complexioned, my father, who's, uh, you know, white and, uh, you know, a bit more on the fairer side, uh, even at that. And then me and my brother, uh, who are, well, I mean, you, you see me here mm -hmm. um, and uh, about your color. And I remember one day, I, and I would have been about five years old, I remember asking my father, he was standing in the kitchen making lunch or something, and I, I said, Dad, I said, I said, Mom is black, right? And he looked at me, he said, yes. And I said, and you're white, right? And he said, that's right. I said, well, I said, what does that make me? And he, he sort of stopped what he was doing, and he, you know, paused and turned to look at me, and he tilted his head, and he said, son, he said, can't you tell? And I said, no. And he picked up my hand and he turned the back of my hand so I could see it. And he said, you're tan. And I said, I'm, I'm tan. And he said, you're tan. And so for the next, literally for the next two years of my life, my self-professed racial identification was tan yeah. uh, until somebody <laughs> came along and told me that that was not actually a thing. Right. <laughs> but, you know, but it put me in this mindset of just thinking that, you know, all race is, is just kind of a surface sort of aesthetic, you know. Um, and, um, and yet I, it didn't really take me too long in engaging just sort of the cultural differences between people to realize that, you know, this, this seems to correlate to, to things, you know, culturally and, 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 and deeper things in terms of how we identify. And, um, I have so many more stories I could tell, and I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much time on it. Um, but you know, I, I did wrestle with this idea of what it means to be kind of authentically black. And like yourself, I, I went through a phase to where I would kind of perform, particularly in a hip hop uh, kind of mode, a certain type of blackness as a means of, you know, signaling that aspect of my identity and maybe as a means of making it real within myself. You know, my dad was deeply culturally critical of hip hop uh, without saying too much. My, my father's father uh, was a big record industry pioneer in the 1950s. He founded Dot Records, which was Pat Boone's mm -hmm. record label. You know, Pat Pat Boone, um, 
very straight up and down, you know, uh, uh, wholesome crooner, uh, you know, kind of guy. And, um, but my dad grew up admiring and loving black people. My dad sort of raised me to be proud of being black. He was a white man who raised me to be proud of being, being black, but not in a political way. Just my dad's heroes in life growing up were Willie Mays, Muhammad Ali, um, Bill Evans, who was a white jazz pianist who played with Miles Davis and John Coltrane. My father's a jazz pianist, and so I grew up around jazz musicians, mostly mostly black and so forth. But for my father, that was the the, the era of America and blackness that he sort of wanted for his son. Hip hop was like this poisonous, poisonous thing. On my mother's side, her, uh, my, my uncle was Mac 10 of the West side connection, uh, which is what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. My <laughs> cousin. Yeah. Right. Uh, my cousin, my cousin's father. And so for folks who don't know, West side connection was uh, ice cubes group after he left uh, NW. Yeah. After he left NWA. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, of course, uh, Thomas knows all about that. Um, Mac one Oh was your uncle. Is your uncle? Is, is my, well, he's my cousin's father. So he's my, my aunt's, uh, my, he and my aunt have two children. Uh, gotcha. and, uh, so I knew him. I mean, you know, I, I, I still know him. Yeah. But, um, you know, but yeah, he, he was a stable, uh, regular figure, uh, in my, uh, orbit, uh, from the time I was very, very young, you know, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think what story should I tell and not tell, but, uh, <laughs> we, we'll, we'll have time to circle back on all sorts of things as we go, man. This won't be the only conversation we have, but just to say that I traveled through these layers of identity and uh, fast forward to the age of, uh, 19 or 20 or so. Uh, fell in love with a woman from the Jordan Downs uh, projects uh, and Watts. We got married. Uh, she went to the army. We moved out of state. But then when we moved back, uh, we, when we moved back to California, because we were pregnant, um, the economy shifted. I lost my job as a medical technician. Long story short, I wound up moving in with her and her family in the Jordan Downs projects and wound up living there for about a year or so. Um, and I, I don't know. I'm not trying to suggest that Watts is my Paris here exactly. But there is a way in which, you know, living around folks, and, and I already had family in inner city LA, but living in the projects, which is its own thing, even within the inner city experience, mm -hmm. you know, definitely, um, you know, it just gave me a window into the fact that there is a whole different American experience here, um, right? And a whole different black experience. And I, mm -hmm. I came to the point of, of being able to say to myself that, you know, my black experience is like no less legitimate than my wife's black experience and vice versa. Um, but the diversity within that spectrum of experiences does point to the trouble with ever kind of labeling the black experience in such a singular and uniform way as we are tempted to do, right? Because I do look at being able to say that, you know, this thing is black or that thing is black. It's like holding the ring of power in like Lord of the Rings terms and mm -hmm. so forth. He who, he or she who can claim blackness can, 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 you know, rule what that means in the minds of both black and white Americans. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, which takes me to something I, which takes me to where I wanted to, to get to, uh, here. Um, I think that we're in this kind of critical moment in American psychological evolution with respect to race, where we were trying to figure out, decide upon what race means, what its social significance is, and how do we orient ourself, ourselves in terms of solving problems that seem deeply tied to, to something that most of, that many of us at least feel to be uh, non-existent as a, as a biological reality and yet very much solid uh, as, as a social reality or something that at least is deeply enmeshed in social reality. And so Ibram Kendi is, uh, I think, the preeminent sort of uh, thinker and voice with respect to uh, the, the ideology of, an, of anti-racism. Um, he is arguably that, uh, and certainly as a black thinker, um, he, he is that. And one thing I, I want to point out about Ibram Kendi is that some people may be surprised to know that um, because you frequently have this criticism of anti-racism that says that, well, they're judging people according to the immutable characteristics of race and therefore anti-racism is itself racist. And uh, I, 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 I understand that critique. Ibram Kendi himself, like you and I, he agrees that race is uh, a social construct. It's not something that is etched in stone. But he has a view of the influence of race 
uh, that says that racism is something that was deliberately foisted upon society several hundred years years ago to justify the slave trade in particular, but to set in place a racial hierarchy that is so determinative of our social and psychological attitudes, even to this day, that we just cannot even begin to make social progress in American life without addressing the reality that uh, we are all racist, really, in, in one way or the other. And in that, by the way, he's different from Robin DiAngelo, who I think seems to suggest that only, well, who, who states that only white people can be racist. Kindy has a more expansive indictment of humanity, which in, in my mind is actually a bit more fair. But <laughs> in any event, um, what do you make of that premise? Do we have to commit ourselves to accepting the fundamental racial nature of reality, even if it is a social construct, if it is going to be the case that we are going to make progress on on the host of, of issues that plague um plague society in America today? Um, or is that attitude itself uh, an albatross around our necks as we try to make progress um, in areas of policy and society today? Well, you know, I just don't see how you can hyper-focus on racial differences and also believe that you'll ever transcend them. Hmm. So I think that, you know, being an anti-racist is obviously what everybody should want to do. We should want to look very seriously at the way that race is inscribed in our society as it exists and also, uh, you know, fight racism, but also keep our, keep our eye on a, on a larger goal, which is that in the future, we want to be done with these categories that come out of the collision of Africa and Europe through the slave trade and, and 400 years of oppression in the new world. We want, we, want, we want to discard these categories that are fundamentally um, compromised. Black and white imply uh, terms of hierarchy that we're not going to salvage. Um, that's the fact. So getting everybody to be hyper aware of their racial difference um, is, 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 to me, it seems like a recipe for keeping these racial differences and the, and the hierarchies they imply alive. Um, as Glenn Lowry always points out, appealing to white people um, appealing to the conscience, consciences and, and the goodwill of white people for your own lot in life seems like um, a way that will always keep you unequal. Um, it might gain all types of things, but equality won't be among them. Um, it's true that whereas Robin DiAngelo says that white people have racism coming out of their pores and therefore are inherently racist, are inherently different than black people, hmm. Kendi doesn't say that. He says that every single idea action or policy so basically every aspect of our lived reality mm. is either racist or anti-racist with nothing in between what other area of life has ever been that simplistically divided into a binary like that we know that life is ambig more ambiguous than this this scheme allows mm. but he's gotten quite far with that and he says that black people can be racist but he doesn't actually mean that black people can be racist against chinese people or koreans the way that he argues whites can be racist against blacks. He means that black people can have ingested certain types of white supremacist ideas, anti-black ideas within themselves. So when he says that I used to have racist ideas, he means that he used to have anti-black ideas. But of course, there's ways in which we can talk about these things that don't deal with either whites or blacks. Well, it, it, he, I, he, he, his reality is a black white reality. Well, it actually might be worth uh, revisiting. Uh, and, and the reason this is fresh on my mind is because I'm reading how to be an anti racist uh, right now, and I'm just about done with it. But he, he does actually have a chapter, a whole chapter in that book that is uh, about whiteness, but that includes something of a history in terms of how it is that black people can be racist towards white people. And so he, he's, he's actually even more distinct from D'Angelo. Uh, in in that sense, part of what he talks about, for instance, is uh, Elijah Muhammad and the history of the nation of Islam and this sort of, uh, you know, very unorthodox um, uh, theology that Elijah Muhammad had, had which basically had this uh, creation story whereby once all of humanity was black and you had this one individual, a scientist who was cast off to a remote island, and in order to achieve vengeance, he basically over time bred white people through lighter and lighter, you know, shades of black The story people. of Yakub. Yeah. Exactly, the story of Yakub. And so, you know, which initially inspired, uh, I mean, so Malcolm X, one would imagine, took on that belief system. But 
part of what Kendi writes about in the book is that Malcolm X abandoned that belief system and that that he, Malcolm came to understand that, you know, uh, there was nothing inherently different, much less evil about white people. And Kendi makes the argument that Malcolm was right to come to that point of view because Muhammad's Elijah Muhammad's theology was a racist one and an example of the fact that black people can have racist, can be racist towards white people. And so, sure. it, and, and so that was something I was actually surprised to read, though, given what I'd been hearing about, right, uh, Kendi's uh, point of view. But I am, um, so. No, I don't it, think yeah. that his point of view is anti-white so much as it's um, overly simplistic and it doesn't mm. describe lived reality. Right. There's the, the idea that you, you, you are either that everything can be boiled down to this binary fails the does does that actually feel mm. like real life test? Right. You know? Right. Uh, here's another argument that one can make against the idea of transcending the racial categories, though. So with Kindy, he says you can't transcend the racial categories because you need to engage them to appreciate this structural racist uh, racist nature of our reality. But a person could also argue, and I think some people will that the racial categories, even if they're not absolute, correlate so tightly to culture that if you ask people to sort of just grow beyond race, maybe that works for individuals. But for groups, you mentioned the fact, and I feel, I again, I resonate with your description, that blackness is, you know, it is, a, it is in, among other things, a tradition. It puts you in a certain sort of historical stream where we have overcome various obstacles. I'm sure you would agree that there's something of sort of a shared cultural memory that passes down in various ways and it kind of binds us, uh, you know, to, to whatever degree to some sort of overarching historical narrative. And um, I think that you would have folks who would argue that if you discard, you know, these categories, you take away what binds us within those contexts, right? And suddenly we just sort of float out undifferentiated into a large, just kind of, you know, civic civic mass where everybody is the same in some generic, generic way. Um, do you ever contemplate um, arguments like that? And uh, how, how do they sure, strike yeah. you? Sure, yeah. No, I address, I address um, at some length those arguments in, in Self-Portrait in Black and White because there's a conversation that I have um, in Berlin with another academic who, who, who raises that's she says, I fear that, you know, giving, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater and giving mm. up, um, race would, would, would give up these kind of cultural attachments, but that actually doesn't have to be true at all. I mean, the idea that these are racial attachments is what I would challenge, but it doesn't mean that, uh, specific community of people and ethnicity, one might even call it, uh, participates in certain traditions. You know, like uh, th that doesn't have to. Th there's nothing about that 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 means it exists in blood and skin. If that makes sense to you, mm. like, um, we need language that describes our lived reality much more specifically, but also does allow. I would say, you know, th becoming an undifferentiated mass of Americans with a common kind of belonging to one another, a common system of values, a common vision, common aspirations that aren't um, ever more hyper-fragmented into specific uh, subsets, that might actually be exactly what we do need, mm. uh, rather than becoming more and more conscious of you know, traditions from the past that we um, derive from, we might actually search for ways to become a kind of um, more unified, broader coalition of people that, um, you know, my idea of a successful American future would be where uh, I look at you and your skin color and hair texture, um, accent, these things don't immediately give me much to work with to understand who you are, what you want, mm. where you come from. Right. I, I, I think that we should look to make identity differences less salient than they are. It doesn't mean you have to stop liking the music you like, stop worshiping the way you want to worship, but it does mean that we should be, I actually do think that, uh, you're never going to get past the things that are so awful right now about the, the divisiveness in our society and the way that it does correlate along racial lines. You're never going to get past that by admitting that it was an error to think of these things as biologically real and then doubling down on them mm. as being socially real and therefore ineluctable, inexorable. Mm. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that some people aren't suffering in ways that... Uh, 
that are beyond an individual suffering that, that correlate with groups, but it means that we need to find new language and we have to have a new idea of what community is, who's, who's in it. I, I think that we have to have a more expansive idea mm. of what we want. I have a friend who uh, some listeners of the podcast will be familiar with, uh, uh, Neil Glover, who appeared in a Brave Rangers event we had with uh, Glenn Lowry not long ago, uh, who makes the argument that he does not like the term uh, black, but that he does embrace the term African-American. And the re- reason for that, is, in his view, is that African brings with it uh, a certain sort of historical and cultural uh, context, which ties us to something that is more real than the more or less arbitrary sort of color designation um, by which we sort of subdivide the human race. Um, I don't know what you think of that, but I do think, um, have you ever been to Lamert Park in in Los Angeles uh, by any chance? I don't think so. Yeah, it's um, well, you know, it's uh, it's just it's it's a little uh, it's a spot in South Central um, L.A. which uh, you know regularly and you know places like this, you know, different parts of America, of course, but that you know regularly regularly uh, plays plays host to uh, you know artists and musicians and vendors and people who kind of come together and very sort of Afrocentric celebration of cultural uh, identity. And it is, it's, you know, just sort of a cultural centerpiece of black Los Angeles. Right. And, you know, one thing that occurs to me is that, you know, there, there is, I think, such a thing as black culture, even if it is highly varied and multifaceted and, um, you know, more diverse than even many black folks perhaps want to you know, articulate or, or concede sometime. And um, I, I don't want to restate the same question a second time, but I, but I guess just to ground it uh, a little bit more, do, do you think that there is something, let's reverse the frame or invert the frame. Do you think that there's something actively worth preserving in terms of the kind of cultural richness and resources, not just of, you know, the black community, but of any particular ethnic, uh, ethnic community. Um, and, um, if, if, if you, if you do, I mean, whether it's, you know, food, music, fashion, deeper cultural teachings, what have you, um, do you not see any tension between that and transcending, transcending the racial labels? I mean, I really don't see any tension there. I mean, we look at, so many different, what is white culture? You know, mm-hmm. you have Italian Americans who have their food, their ways of dress, their ways of talking, the, the kind of customs that they've brought with them from the old world and preserved in the new context. You've got Irish Americans who've done the same. You've got Jewish Americans. Some are Sephardic, some are Ashkenazi. They've got right. their traditions, their ways of worshiping, their ways of signaling to each other membership in a community. And yet we don't say that these people are all different races from each mm. other. Right. In fact, we have an overly simplistic way of reducing them all to some type of whiteness. Mm. Um, black people are no less diverse. Uh, your friend or, or your interview subject who said that he prefers the term African-American, I mean, a pretty black looking guy, Stanley Crouch, would vehemently disagree uh, mm rest in peace he would vehemently disagree with that he hated the term african-american preferred yeah. the term negro mm. uh, thought african-american didn't describe anything having to do with the american reality that he comes from mm. which ha- has been cut off for so long from africa as to not be as to not be part mm. as to not be in dialogue with africa in right. meaningful ways you know many many black americans uh don't like the term african-american or didn't or preferred negro or preferred colored there is so many different points of view on this. My point is only to say that there is not an, an agreed upon perspective there. Now, in the 21st century, you've got ever increasing amounts of uh, recent arrivals uh, from Nigeria, from from different parts of West Africa, from Ghana, from uh, the West Indies, you, who also call themselves black. Some of whom, as we've seen with uh, with the vice president candidate uh, mm. Kamala Harris yeah. even call themselves African American in certain mm. contexts. So what are we even talking about anymore? Mm-hmm. These descriptors fail us on so many levels. It doesn't mean that we can't belong to communities and have traditions worthy of preserving, but it does mean that we use language in a way that often obscures more of the complexity of, of our lived reality than it illuminates. Right. So the racial conversation in all of its dynamics, I think, is I, I, it's clearly complicated, right? 
And it would be fine for it to be complicated if it weren't for the fact that, uh, particularly depending on who you might be, there's real social risks to be taken in trying to, you know, speak to this general sort of issue set. Um, one broad kind of example of that is just the fact that, uh, you know, one of my big issues with uh, Kindy's larger kind of thesis is the fact that he he makes he makes this point that because there because race is not real then all racial groups are 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 in fact uh, equal which you know I'm, I'm i'm certainly on board with but then he goes to make the point that all all uh, all cultures are equal and while i would certainly agree that you know there are there are facets of all cultures which you wouldn't want to draw value distinctions between if we're just looking within the frame of one culture compared to better or worse versions of itself, I would imagine that, you know, if you're in a context where culturally, you know, violence has become more prevalent or drug addiction has emerged as a more prominent sort of thing, um, these things can maybe in many or most cases in, in the black context be uh, be linked to systemic factors which are outside of folks' control. but. It still leaves me, at least, let me just speak for myself, thinking, but we need to have a cultural conversation. There's nothing nothing uh, invalid about framing things that way. And yet, that, particularly if I wasn't a person of color myself, might potentially be a cancelable offense uh, for, for, some, for somebody else, right? And so I want to I wanna jump onto that uh, point here, uh, because you were one of the primary authors of the Harper's Letter, correct? And um, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us just very quickly, what was the Harper's Letter? What, what, sure. what did it do? Well, first of all, I just want to say, you know, it's so obviously untrue on its face that what he says about all cultures being uh, equal and that there are no differences and that it's racist. To... Confusing culture with race is, first of all, one of the things that racists themselves do. Culture right. is not race. Hmm. And and to say to say that all cultures uh, should have exactly the same outcomes makes no sense whatsoever. And if you take black people out of the of the question, clearly, clearly, he he also argues that uh, all significant group group differences are either the result of uh, um, inherent inferiority, which he rejects, or racist policy. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to ask him this uh, at Bard you know, at Bard College last year when he came to speak, and I was a visiting fellow and in the audience, but he didn't have a satisfactory answer. But basically, you can look at discrepancies uh, between groups, such as um, Chinese Americans and Irish American, Irish descended Americans, mm. you know, and there will be extraordinary discrepancies in achievement and in, in standardized testing scores, and and, and the, his scheme only explains that mm. by saying that there must be a policy. In, in, right. Unless Chinese yeah. Americans are inherently superior, then there must be some type of a policy mm. aspect to this that uh, that makes an unequal outcome inevitable. Mm. That's nonsense. Right. Clearly, certain cultures value certain behaviors, uh, just like families value certain behaviors, and there's variance within it. It doesn't mean it tells you anything about individuals. But you can you can you can make cultural arguments that have nothing to do with uh, being based on biology or race. Yeah, I mean, I I feel I feel the same way. Um, now I think that um, I mean just just to say, just to say very quickly, I I do feel like there's something eminently understandable about wanting to wanting to make the claim that you know look, different people are different, and different does not mean inferior, right? And I think that in our history, you can see a long kind of uh, arc of, like you said, sort of racist ideas that do sort of seem to add up to that point of view, right? But just, right. To, but, but just, yeah, but just, just to because your... that's the case doesn't right. mean that in all instances this uh, this 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 is incorrect. So you know, certain cultures value certain things. You know, if you if you Take a look at a culture that uh, values honor mm-hmm. and can lead to uh, honor killings when a member of a family violates a certain sense of honor. To say that there's no difference between that and a kind of easygoing Southern California culture that would mm-hmm. never um, harm uh, a member of the family for making choices that, mm-hmm. that, that go against the grain of, right. of received uh, 
thinking. I mean, one must be able to distinguish between between something that that causes harm and something that that that, that, that does not. And yeah. in this scheme, saying that everything is exactly the same, uh, again, it obscures more than it illuminates. Mm. It, in fact, there's a lot to be gained from understanding where cultures vary from each other, what they value, and why some of the things that we value in certain contexts are not necessarily meaningful in other contexts. It, it, yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very frustrating when, whenever somebody kind of reduces reality to very simple binaries, either ors, it becomes very problematic. It's very difficult to, to engage because there's everything that you would say to counter that kind of bounces off of it. Mm, yeah. And yeah, I, I by no means want to drag us kicking and screaming off of off of this topic because, you know, I'm deeply, deeply interested in it. Um, but I do want to get to the cultural question of what it means that we cannot seem to have conversations about these and other subjects in, in ways that don't honest conversations in ways that don't at least potentially seem to bring with them uh, the prospect of severe social uh, severe social costs for, for individuals, right? And so that's why I wanted to uh, dig into the Harper's letter just, just a bit, and uh, I don't know how much, how much time, time you have here, um, but uh, in, in, our, in our closing minutes, I just want to ask you, first of all, what, what was the Harper's, Harper's letter? And um, just so anybody who's not familiar with it can understand, then I've got a question to follow that. Sure. The, uh, you know, in July, uh, we published a letter in Harper's Magazine. On July 7th, uh, a letter on justice and open debate um, signed by 150 or so uh, writers and cultural figures, making a very simple argument that uh, we're in a situation where um, our cultural and media institutions um, are becoming more and more censorious, less liberal. There's a kind of creeping a liberalism uh, that doesn't argue or disagree with points of view, but silences them. That people are less able to um, think out loud and possibly even make mistakes uh, without being publicly shamed or, or fired. You know, there's an element of um, people's employment coming into jeopardy. Um, and this is not simply a problem that comes from the left. This also comes from the right. There's a kind of air of censoriousness, a climate of censoriousness that's gaining ground. And it's exacerbated by um, social media. Hmm. It's exacerbated by um, a kind of call out culture and a, and a, and a vogue for public shaming. And our, the letter was simply a reaffirmation of very basic liberal um, principles of freedom of speech. Hmm. And it was uh, it, the, the letter also, you know, it was fundamentally making an argument that, um, of course, we, we, we stand for and want um, a society that's equal, that's more inclusive, but you can't really separate uh, equality from freedom. And that right. uh, if you have to get equality by diminishing freedom, then uh, no one is actually, this is not going to be an equality that can last because this is a kind of pyrrhic victory. Mm. And down the road, somebody else will flip the tables. And so basically, people are maximally equal when they're maximally free. Mm. And minorities actually do the best in, in, in social contexts that are um, uh, tolerant of diverging viewpoints. Mm. My, I mean, my, my biases are to be sympathetic to the, the values of, that are expressed and the concerns that are expressed in the Harvard's letter. But I do want to ask you to respond to uh, uh, criticism that are levied towards it and just the general position of concern over cancel culture. Um, well, one from the left and one from the right. Actually, uh, let me rephrase that. Criticisms of the letter itself, uh, I, I should say. So we had uh, a, a debate over cancel culture which uh, at Braver Angels recently, which uh, you were invited to, but you reminded me that uh, the time we were having it uh, was an ungodly hour in, in Paris. And so, you know, we'll have to... Uh, we'll, we'll have to get you to, out to something where the schedule uh, schedule lines up. But we had Andrew Sullivan and uh, and uh, uh, Ken Bone joined us. Hawk Newsom took the the uh, the um, uh, opposing uh, perspective from Sullivan, James Lindsay, and other other folks. Uh, one of the people who joined us is a very compelling uh, a young woman named Siobhan Taylor, who who made this uh, point, not just respect with respect to the letter, but just the position in general that says that you ultimately cannot. Um, regulate cancel culture um, without uh, w without diminishing the right of marginalized or oppressed people uh, 
to challenge the status quo. Uh, she actually, in a sense, was making sort of a pro, you know, free speech argument along the lines of, you know, if you have the right to complain about cancel culture, I nevertheless have the right to advocate that certain people be canceled because they are safeguarding a system which is maintaining the structure uh, of, of my and other people's oppression. Uh, speak to that. Do you see a tension? Do you see a tension there between? You well, know, yeah, we were not uh, trying to silence anybody's uh, speech. I think that, you know, like Christopher Hitchens said, when you um, move to violate someone's free speech rights or when you advocate violating their free speech uh, rights, you're making the rod for your own back. I think that mm. there should be maximal space for criticism. Um, people should be able to to publicly uh I guess the term would be call out things that uh, bother them. That's, that's criticism. That's fine. What we are talking about is institutions being quick to fold. Um, sure. I would like to, I would like to persuade people to be less likely to less, less eager to pile on. Um, I think that we live in a, in, in, in a situation where technology um, actually um, it cannot be taken out of the equation when you have um thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people um, calling for somebody to lose their employment. <laughs> and that overwhelms the institution at which they work. And that institution makes a snap judgment uh, to, to rid themselves of the problem uh, without due process. We're in new right. terrain now. This is, this is unprecedented. This is not simply minorities um, having the ability to, to challenge the status quo. This is this is mob justice, in fact. Mm. Uh, so I don't want to silence uh, anybody, but I also want institutions to be a bit more responsible and a bit slower to react to the kind of um, storms of opprobrium that can be whipped up um, and often can be whipped up quite disingenuously um, online. Mm. Uh, Twitter um, has, 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 has inserted itself into people's HR departments in a way that's distinctly unhealthy. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, I think that what happens is that somebody, um, we need to hear more speech, but bad ideas need to be, um, need to be countered. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that there's anything to be gained by um, confusing bad ideas with uh, people themselves and saying that some people are beyond the, the pale of, uh, the, people are suffering social deaths for, for, for thinking wrong. Mm. And this has a very chilling effect. The thing that, about cancel culture, and we never use the term cancel culture because it's been co-opted and used quite disingenuously by Donald Trump and others on the right. But the thing that happens in this dynamic is fundamentally that, um, that there's an onlooker effect. You don't have to actually cancel that many people for people to see what happens and to, 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 to narrow themselves and to preemptively limit what they are willing to say, what they are willing to risk right. for fear of being piled on. And this, this perverts the whole public sphere because we need, we need maximal free speech because we don't even know all the things we don't know. Mm. Um, and so you have many instances that you can point out of people. It's not just minorities um, going against the status quo. It's people getting um, a curator fired at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art because he's, what did he do? The thing about cancel culture that's so that's so difficult is that it's not punishing people for transgressing established norms. It's punishing people, making examples of people who have transgressed norms that are in the process of being established, mm. shifting norms, new norms. Mm, right. Curator Gary Garrels at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art makes the remark that he, they're going to be committed to buying more Black and uh, Latino painters. Mm. And they're also going to, don't worry, we're still going to, we're still going to buy white painters. Mm. He, he loses his job for this comment, for saying that the museum will still acquire white paintings. Mm. Right. That's no established norm that's been transgressed. That's something new. Well. The, 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 David Shore loses his job at Civis Analytics for sharing research without even adding commentary on it about the efficacy of violent protest in a presidential election year, right. about what it does for democratic chances at the polls. He lost his job for this. This is what we're arguing against. We're not arguing against minorities speaking up against a uh, status quo that has often been uninterested in hearing what they think. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to imagine how it is that we can come to a place as a society of authentically embracing new norms, if that's what's going to happen, if so much of the motivation for doing that in the short term stems from fear, right? And it that 
you know, clearly I think seems to be, seems to be the case, uh, you know, but, but it's quite a thing because, you know, you've got folks who are earnestly pushing for, for deep change. Right. And I think that many Americans feel like, yeah, something is, something's wrong. Something's got to be up with, uh, our systems and the way they impact folks. And I think that, you know, most Americans are open to the idea that we need to really kind of look at changes and improvements that can be made in the structure of, of life. But, you know, on the other hand, do we overwhelm, overwhelm the norms of, you know, not just civil discourse, but this idea that, you know, people, if, if there are changes we need to make in our attitudes, surely that's something that takes place with some seasoning, the maturation of, of time, right? And so, well, I think in a situation where you're having a lot of norms contested and shifting very rapidly, you have to err on the side of maximal tolerance and maximal grace if you want to go in that direction. I mm -hmm. think that people have to be uh, allowed to make mistakes uh, mm -hmm. without suffering social death to to um, overcome and repair themselves after mistakes, even public ones. Uh, right. I think that we're in a very unforgiving place. One of the people that signed the letter that um, most impressed me is a guy named Reginald Dwayne Betts. Hmm. He's a black American poet and writer who went to um, adult prison at the age of 16 for a carjacking hmm. and did eight hard years before graduating, right. um, becoming a Radcliffe fellow, graduating from Yale Law, winning a national magazine award, becoming an, an absolutely, absolutely impressive guy. Right. But he said he signed the letter because he's worried about a culture that's becoming increasingly unforgiving, that doesn't allow uh, chances of redemption. You know, this letter uh, was not just signed by white people who are trying to preserve the status quo. Mm. We had refugees signing it. We had people that are currently living in uh, Algeria with a fatwa. Mm -hmm. uh, Kamel Daoud, we have had people from all walks of life. But the, the thing that was alarming to anybody who signed that letter was the idea that we were becoming uh, more censorious and more illiberal, less liberal. Um, and that this is actually having a quite a chilling effect on, on, on not just on speech, but on thinking. Right. Um, the idea that somebody whose views go against yours have, has to be silenced and they have to lose their employment. This is not a healthy uh, space for public thinking when you go in that direction. So on the subject of who signed the letter, uh, one of the criticisms of the letter that I have heard, and I, I imagine you must have heard this uh, your, yourself by now, uh, is that for a lot of uh, folks on the right, for a lot of conservatives, uh, they generally share this concern about threats to freedom of speech and so forth. And uh, I've, you know, I've heard from a number of conservatives who felt that the letter sort of started off kind of uh, distancing itself uh, from them, uh, I guess, by opening with the with the claim that, you know, uh, threats to freedom of speech are very much present on the right, very much, you know, present with respect to, you know, the things that President Trump is is doing. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, the way it read to a number of conservatives was it's sort of like, you know, I'll look, we see this as being a huge problem on the right. Don't think that we're pro-Trump or that we're cuddling up too closely with, you know, with, with right wingers, but nevertheless, we want to make a critique of the, you know, of, of the left leaning, uh, you know, forces in terms of, in terms of cancel culture and so on and so forth. I heard you say in a conversation with Matt Taibbi, uh, recently that there are certain folks who you, uh, would like to have, uh, signed on to the letter, who I guess you guys didn't approach because you thought that ultimately uh, cancel culture being what it seems to be, that it would have made the letter less effective. It would have made you guys more vulnerable to have been associated with people who you personally think had something positive perhaps to, to author, uh, to, to offer. I, I, I'm wondering, um, do you see a tension between wanting to take this stand on the one hand, but wanting to make you or anybody else wanting to make common cause with folks who may be uh, more, maybe more conservative in their politics, uh, who may even have some sympathy or support for president Trump, but who nevertheless share concerns about the consequences of, of assaults on freedom of speech, just to put it, put it. Well, simply. that's, that's, that's a big question that, with several moving parts, but first of all, uh, we do have conservatives who signed the letter. David mm -hmm. Frum signed it. Francis Fukuyama signed it. Those are conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, 
pro-Trump, though notably uh, anti-Trump, right? people on the right. I don't know that those are people that are committed to the vision of liberalism mm -hmm. that uh, is embodied in the letters, um, three paragraphs. We mm -hmm. have a we have a defense of liberalism that is kind of contradicted by um, outright support for Donald Trump. So. Mm -hmm. There was space for conservatives, but there's probably not space. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for me to see how some uh, a president playing with authoritarianism, a criminal president, a president who regularly silence, silences speech, um, packs his uh, administration with cronies and yes men could be in any way a defender of liberalism. You have an instance just a several days ago where um, a courage award for a journalist was rescinded from the White House because the journalist in, who was supposed to be honored uh, had made uh, disparaging remarks of Donald Trump about Donald Trump on Twitter. So this is not this is not a position that's coherent to be pro-Trump and to be concerned about to be in a serious way concerned about freedom of speech and uh, creeping authoritarianism and illiberalism. Mm. Right. So 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 oh. that I just I don't take that kind of critique very seriously at all. Mm. Um, but there's a very ideologically diverse uh, group of people that did sign the letter from Francis Fukuyama to Noam Chomsky. Is, there's quite a lot of uh, space in between. Mm, right, indeed. Um, as yeah. far as wanting people to sign who didn't sign, I mean, it was a very catch-as-catch-can process where we reached out to people and the letter kept growing. And at some point we had to cap names. Uh, I spoke with Matt Taibbi about having, personally having wanted to uh, ask Glenn Greenwald, but it turned out that I went back through the old emails. Uh, I talked about this with Glenn. We did a podcast together with Camille. Um, there's certainly no hard feelings there. I have a lot of respect for Glenn. I was supposed to have reached out to him and I didn't get around to it by the time that we capped the signatures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were multiple people like that where you could have imagined them signing. But mm -hmm. at this point, the letter, at some point you cap the letter and it's over. And one of the people that didn't get on the letter initially and the only one whose name we added on afterwards was Cornell West, because at the time we were throwing names together and we were getting the list together and we were moving forward. And we didn't see that we had gotten the response from his assistant saying that he mm. very much wanted to sign. Mm. Yeah. And so we just added his name to the list. Uh, so, you know, this is not um, a definitive list of people who have been silenced, canceled or who care about free speech. It was just, you know, it was a document signed by people trying to make a persuasive case. Mm. Right. Yeah, indeed. Thomas, uh, are you willing to come back for a round two sometime, man? Because uh, Yeah, with pleasure, man. <laughs> Always good to talk to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's just so many places I think uh, this conversation needs to go. And there's some things where we just started to scratch the surface that I think uh, deserve some, some deeper digging into. So, man, I really appreciate you coming through and sharing your experiences, the depth of your perspectives, and just your overall contribution to the public discourse and so forth. Uh, I don't mind uh, going out... Uh, front uh, and saying that the conversation is a lot better, I think, for the presence of Thomas Chatterton Williams. So I thank you very much Brent, for that. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And so for folks listening to this podcast, if this conversation was valuable to you, if the work of building bridges across our divides is valuable to you, then get involved. Check out Braver Angels at braverangels.org. Become a member and like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. We are building a house united. Until next time. This is the Brain of Angels podcast. I'm John Wood Jr.